so uh, Mario, could you start off by introducing yourself? Yeah, so um, as you all know, Mario with um, the Ellen Coalition for Immigrant Justice. Um, yeah, I came on board the coalition um, while my case was still um, happening while I was detained at, at um, Adelanto. And so what happened was my sister got in touch with the coalition and um, they were able to like really build like this um, community-based advocacy uh, for my release, um, which is a huge, it's, it, it's a huge support because, you know, um, like unfortunately, um, a lot of the folks that get detained in our communities are because they've had some sort of previous encounter with um, with authorities. And so, yeah, I came on board in late 2018 and I've been here ever since. And at the moment, I'm currently leading the Emergency Response Network, which is a hotline that we have available for folks 24 seven to report any ICE or CBP uh, presence, presence in the community and um, or anybody that's being that that's been affected by uh, deportation or um, detention. And what does the emergency response network do? So what we do is a few things. First of all, we we want to document um, every arrest because we know that obviously, like ICE is a rogue entity in itself. So they are violating numerous human rights. So we want to document all of that because depending on that, we can hopefully get cases dismissed um, by judges. And then also um, it serves as a way for us to like advocate for um, policies or advocate for folks that, that found themselves arrested under these like um, human rights violations. Um, and then also we serve as a resource, um, as a resource for, for those folks that are, have found themselves detained or, or their families. So we provide legal resources, um, humanitarian, um, just anything that they might need, emotional support. A lot of them, you know, they don't know what, what's gonna happen. They don't know what the next step is going to be. And so as somebody that has lived through it and has been through it, um, I think it, it helps kind of relieve some of that anxiety. Um, so yeah, definitely. It's, it, it's, it's multifaceted and it's, it's a whole system that, that we use for that. Was I see IJ something you were familiar with um, prior to your sister reaching out? Um, and like how, what was your interaction then? And then how did that kind of lead into you now becoming the immigrant justice fellow there? Yeah, no, I, I, I honestly did not have any idea. And I think it comes to the, it comes down to like, you know, some folks are just not engaged with immigration policies. And as, um, as an, as an immigrant myself, like I should have been, more informed, but I wasn't. So um, yeah, like uh, when my sister reached out to them, they were like super helpful and they were able to like really provide support, which I found very, um, it was definitely like very like, all right, someone's fighting for, for me on the outside, you know, it's not just us in here. Um, but yeah, I didn't know. I, I don't think a lot of people know um, what resources are available. Um, but definitely, I think during this administration, like, I think those resources have been able to like speak out loud a lot more and be able to like prove that they are there for their communities. Um, one of the questions that, um, that one of the other planning committee members had was uh, he had known somebody who was, or had heard the story of somebody who was um, imprisoned at San Quentin. 
um, served out his sentence and then was immediately picked up and went to Adelanto and uh, shared their experience and said that um, Adelanto was worse in a lot of ways in that it that facility didn't provide resources or even recreational activity um, and obviously worse conditions and less medical support. And so um, to me, that kind of sounds like what you're talking about, about people not even realizing that there are these resources um, when they're there. So once your sister kind of reached out and you knew that there were people on the outside kind of fighting for your release, um, has there been some kind of network that has been set up um, or been able to even set be set up um, within Adelanto that like people know that, oh, these there's these outside organizations that are willing to help us. We just need to get in touch. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, there's we've had the shutdown Adelanto coalition going on since they um, started back in, I believe, 2011, I might be wrong. Um, but, you know, there's there's all these different coalitions that have come together um, to really talk about like what's really happening in this in, in these de detention centers and what folks are ex are experiencing. Um, so yeah, and then obviously, like through throughout my fellowship and throughout my work with ICAJ, we've done a lot of um, outreach to those folks that have been impacted, and so we get calls on a daily basis from people that find themselves detained at Adelanto or their families that are in need of legal services or humanitarian support because it it is, you know, most of the times like. The people that are being arrested are the sole breadwinners. And so once they are detained or once they're deported, what happens with the families? Right. So def we've definitely done um, a lot of outreach to our communities to let them know that we are here to provide support and to, pro and to provide res resources to them. I think Mario you have oh, go ahead. Uh, Mario, what was the hardest part for you about being held in Adelanto? You know, the hardest part is that there's a very high level of uncertainty of what's going to happen with you. You don't, you know, we, we know that immigration policies and laws change on a daily basis. We know that, you know, one day you're eligible for something, one day you're not. And so the uncertainty, the uncertainty of not knowing what's going to happen with you, whether you'll be able to, you know, remain in the U.S. with your family, or are you going to be deported to a country that you haven't been familiar with for decades or years, is I think the worst part. Um, and with that comes, you know, like. All prisons should be abolished, period. But when it comes down to it, like prisons, like you might have like a, an idea of how long you're gonna be there. With immigration detention, you don't know. And so it's it's it really eats at you the fact that you don't know when you're gonna be able to see your your family or your loved ones. Um Kind of following that note, then I was wondering if you would feel comfortable sharing if you did live in fear, which it sound, sounded like you did definitely while you were um, at Adelanto, but if you still do and um, if there was ever a time where you didn't. And to, as some kind of background, again, you don't have to answer that if you don't feel comfortable, but um, for me, I was thinking about the first generation Japanese uh, immigrants that had come over and how a lot of them had lived in the United States for decades uh, before World War II and then all of a sudden were rounded up. Um, they never, they at the time, they there was no pathway to citizenship for them, so they, it's not like they were living in fear of ICE because ICE didn't exist. Um, and so 
but I know that now is very different reality. So I was wondering if you did feel comfortable to share if you, there ever was a time where you weren't fearful and what that switch would have been like um, to being afraid. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, from, from the beginning when my family came to the US when I was five, um, there were definitely like these talks of, all right, like we cannot share too much about our info mm -hmm. be because this is our background and, um, you know, like this could lead us to, you know, possibly repercussions. Um, I don't think I really felt afraid until when I was finishing high school and I was having to like apply for colleges and apply for all of these other things. And I saw that those were not available to me. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I was like, okay, like I, I think, I think I'm vulnerable because of, because of this, because of my, because of my status. But I think it's, it was like very pointed and clear to me that I had limitations. And that's when I became afraid because I knew that I was not on the same level of some of like my friends or family members who did have status. Um, and I was gonna be treated like a second class citizen in a sense, you know? Like I remember calling to, wa to wanting to apply um, to open up a bank account and the, um, the person on the line um, laughed at me when I told them that I didn't have like a social and I didn't have like a California ID. So that's when it was like, okay, like this is, this is serious, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so like, thankfully, like I think DACA came along and it was, it was a, it was a very, it was like a bandaid on a very bad wound. You know, it was like a very tiny bandaid. Band -aid. Um, and so I was able to get that. But the thing with those relief programs is that you literally cannot make any mistake. You have to be, um, you're, you're held at a certain pedestal you cannot make any mistakes. You cannot do anything wrong because it, it's, it's just taken away from you. And that's, that's awful because, you know, we're, we're already living in fear, like, and, and now we're living in, in a world where we have to be perfect and we have to be the perfect immigrant. And if you're not, then you don't deserve to be here, um, which I think is just horrible. Thank you for sharing. Um, wow. Uh, Mario, yeah. could you uh, tell us something about the lack of resources in Adelanto, like, like medical help? Yeah, definitely. So Adelanto is very secluded and isolated. And most of the detention centers are built that way for a reason and for that, for that same reason, because they wanna make it as, um, as difficult as possible for folks to be able to get the resources that they need and for them to receive any kind of support. So there are so many, there's numerous reports coming from Adelanto talking about, um, all of the dangers, you know, in health, and medical, legal, um, I think every aspect of it, every every need that anybody that finds themselves in detention, um, it's all very difficult to access. Um, and so it, it just comes down to the point where it's almost like non-existent. Like medical is very, you know, just again, like let's put a Band-Aid on a bullet hole. Um, let's give you ibuprofen, ibuprofen for any kind of um, illness. Um, attorneys find themselves like waiting several hours 
to see their clients. And so also they become a little bit frustrated and they don't want to wait. You know, they have other cases as well. And families find themselves find themselves having to drive hours to visit their loved ones. And so it's they make they they literally make it a point to make it as difficult as possible for anybody that's detained to really be able to get any support or resources. What was the impact on your family when you were detained? So I was lucky enough that I was that my family lives like only an hour away from Adelanto. So I was able to see them and I was able to talk to them. And that is the sole main reason why I was able to endure six months detained. Um, but then again, we have those folks that, you know, they're asylum seekers or their families are not in the Inland Empire and they don't get those visits, they don't get those letters. And so that's, that's you know, those are the folks that we need to worry about because your mental health does, you know, it does, it gets worse. It gets really bad. I definitely see it um, taking a toll exponentially. Um, but speaking about resources and how before you were talking about how outreach is so important um, and vital, um, I think that's kind of a good segue into um, ICIJ being a coalition mm -hmm. of like 35, 40 different organizations, uh, which I think is great. And it speaks a lot also to like our theme for DOR of being uniting other communities uh, to keep democracy alive and how important it is to have solidarity work um, and to not just keep reinventing the wheel um, yeah. and like stronger together in numbers and that we are all fighting for the same things um, coming from different on ramps, but eventually driving towards the same goal. And so I was wondering if you can kind of talk about what it's like being, being part of a coalition um, and I guess like the main the organizer of, or the connector to all these 35 plus um, orgs. And then to, well, I'll let you answer that one first. Yeah, so I think it's it's amazing that we're able to um, collectively convene all of our coalition partners because every single one of them has, some, has something to offer to the undocumented and, and vulnerable um, communities. Um, you know, not only are we talking about folks that find themselves incarcerated, like we also see people of, people from the LGBTQ communities, people that, you know, maybe were advocating for workers' rights or um, environmental justice. So we're able to like convene all of these different intersectional um, partners so that they can um, collaborate with us and like really continue like moving forward with our message that um, immigration is very intersectional and all of us are able, all of us should be able and are able to support in some way or another. One of the questions the uh, committee had is, um, uh, I, uh, ICIJ, do, does it work uh, not just with uh, la the Latino community, but does it work with Haitians and Africans and, and, um, uh, and, and other communities? Yeah, so definitely we, we work with everyone. Um, it doesn't matter um, where they come from. Like at the end of the day, we know that everyone needs to be liberated and everybody deserves the right to be free and to live their own, to live their own lives and to be happy. Um, so it, yeah, it doesn't matter where they come from. We just want to be able to support anybody that's being released, released from detention. 
I personally really like how um, you decided to just throw yourself into it too uh, and become a fellow at ICIJ. And I was wondering um, if, like how many of those who you, who ICIJ has worked with um, has after getting out have like continued to engage with ICIJ and if there has been any crossover in support to additional initiatives because I know y'all do much more than just um like trying to get people out of out onto like there's all your street vendor work and stuff so I was wondering if um there is crossover um and or if there are people like going who are formerly detained going to help out with your street vendor um, kind of initiatives or even like those that cross over into policy work more. I mean, if you can talk about that. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, um, what I found is that most of the people that have been released from Adelanto do want to continue um, working as um, leaders and advocates for those that are still detained. Um, it, it's, 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 it's kind of hard to really walk away from this issue or walk away from, from what's happening um, after you've been released because you know so much and you want to do something or you want to be able to help others that um, are still detained or still going through this. And so we've been able to really um, uplift their voices, uplift their leadership, and really like be able to um, bring them to the forefront of this of this movement and have them be the leaders, and you know um, have them give them a space and give them a say when it comes to like decisions or any kind of policies that we support or campaigns. Um, so it's, it's definitely been really, it's been really cool for me to be able to like build these leaders because I know I, I had like such great, um, I had such, I, I do and I had and I do have such great mentors um, at ICIJ and so I just wanted to like pay it forward and be able to like provide these um, resources for those folks as well. In your work with uh, ICIJ, uh, I imagine you've worked with a lot of individuals and helped a lot of families. What's the toughest moment that you've experienced? So the toughest moment was actually the first intake that I did for somebody that was picked up by ICE in our community. And um, I was working with one of my colleagues at that, at that time, it was like super early into like um, my fellowship with ICAJ. And it had turned out that ICE had picked up um, this, this man. He had a family, a wife and two kids. And um, they, had, they reached out to us for help. Um, we went to their house. This is pre-COVID. This is like back in the days when we couldn't meet in person. Um, we met him. We met in person. We did an intake, and um, the kids didn't know what had happened. Only the the spouse, and so the spouse was just you know she did not know what to do or what to say to the kids. So we had to step in and say, okay, your dad has been detained. Um, this is what's going to happen. This is what you, what you, what you can expect but we're going to do our best to like liberate him. And so that was the first time where I had to like have a talk with a family and say like, this is happening. It's real, but there are, um, there are ways that we can liberate your, your dad. There, there are ways that we can support. And, um, and I think that it helped them just, even if it was just like a little bit, because it provided some sense of, okay, like somebody has been through it, somebody knows what's going on. Um, turns out the dad came home the same day, which was amazing and never heard of. Um, but that's been like the toughest one. And after that, it's been like, 
all right, I know what to expect now. Were the kids crying? Yes, they were crying. Um, and they were they were teenagers. Um, I still keep in touch with them as well. I still like follow up and say, hi, how's, how's everything going? Um, but yeah, that, that was tough. It was tough because I, I knew that I could not, as much as I wanted to just like break down and cry with them, like I knew that that was not a possibility. Like I could not do that because they were looking to us for, for help and for strength. Um, sorry, I guess I need to change the battery in my smoke detector because <laughs> it just started beeping. So I'm going to periodically mute myself. Um, but I was wondering for, in talking about coalitions, since we're talking about um, like the power of working with other communities for your common goals um, and how ICIJ is great because it is kind of the meeting place for all of these organizations. Um, but ICIJ I know is also part of, or it takes part in the Detention Watch Network um, and specifically in the Communities Not Cages campaign. Uh, so I was wondering if you can speak a little to that as being like the bigger kind of umbrella organizer for ICIJ, but then kind of being just one of the components of an even larger national network and what it's like to work together. So it's, yeah, it's it's been amazing um, getting to work with the Japanese American community, the um, with Nikkei Progressives and Never Again and um, Haitian Bridge, Bridge Alliance, you know, like we all have a lot in common. Um, and so it's been amazing to like really look into their leadership and their perspectives to be able to continue doing this work, continue our campaigns. Um, and they're amazing allies. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't even call them allies. I would call them more accomplices because they are and have been on the ground with us. They've been at actions. They've been at court hearings. Um, they've held you know, numerous uh, fundraising efforts. And so that is what a true ally slash accomplice is. And so it's it's been amazing and it's been a privilege to be able to like convene all of these different groups and all, and all of these different communities um, that have so much in common and um, so much to give and to do. One of the comments that came up in the uh, the committee was that you know it seems like uh, unjust incarceration is a common thread among communities of color. Uh, I was wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, there's definitely a there's very clear systems of oppression that have been built into our justice and immigration um, systems. Um, and they've been designed to like keep us down and keep us oppressed. Um, and it comes, it, there's been so many like brilliant voices and folks and characters that have been silenced because of it as well, you know, because they have tried to advocate for these folks that find themselves um, incarcerated in one way or another. Um, so I think last year we saw like a really good um, example of what can happen when we all come together and really fight against these policies and laws that were in place to, to keep us down and to oppress us. Um, and I just really wanted to continue because if one of, our, one of us is not safe, none of us are. And so, you know, we've all gone, we've all been through some sort of like discrimination or segregation or incarceration. And so, yeah, we definitely need to continue working together for this. Go ahead, Andy. Um, 
Well, if you have other questions, I also eventually, you can answer this now or if Alan has others. Um, for DOR, at least the Los Angeles DOR, we traditionally have some kind of call to action um, at the end. So it's not just like you hear a bunch of stuff and then you walk away till next year kind of thing, but what are things you can do? And so um, in speaking with you, are there actionable items that people can take as an individual um, and or as a larger organization? There's many ways that folks can get involved and it all depends on their capacity. Um, we wanna make sure that the folks that do get involved continue to be engaged and that they continue supporting this movement. So what we've done is um, we've created like this not this is, yeah, it's, it's like a system. So basically if you text the word Adelanto to 797979, um, you'll be able to access different ways that you can support, whether it be um, financially, um, as a volunteer, providing humanitarian resources, um, advocacy. There are many times that we're, we, you know, do find ourselves having to call our representatives or people that are making those lawmakers. So there's very different ways. So we wanted to really make sure that we um, have one way that, one accessible way that people can tap into to be able to continue participating with us. Okay. Uh, kind of along that line, uh, you know, looking to the future, what, what uh, what would you say is the potential that exists in the community if there were no detention centers? There's such a great sense of community and we've seen it. Um, and I'm, I'm speaking specifically in the Inland Empire, but I'm also bringing on like folks that have supported us, um, such as Naked Progressives and um, other movements, but there's definitely a sense that as a community, we are able to provide support and resources to our members. Um, there is no need for incarceration when, you know, there's mental illness. Um, there's no need for incarceration if you have a family that's waiting for you um, to be home. So, Definitely know, like, as, as, as community organizers and as a community, we are able to provide and support all of the folks, no matter what, you know? Um, and I think it's, it's been very clear um, ever since we were able to provide numerous um, resources for folks that were being dropped off in San Bernardino without um, any kind of support. Um, so ever since then, it's it's been like very clear that as a community, like we can do a lot more than what we find um, policymakers do for us. I think one of the things you mentioned a little while ago about um, in terms of actionable items and uh, for people who wanna get involved, how important it is that you find the people who will continue to do the work and it's not just like they'll lose interest in it. Um, and in thinking about keeping democracy alive, like it is constant work that'll never stop um, in the very nature of it being a democracy. Yeah. Um, and so I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about how ICIJ addresses sustainability in terms of like organizations that are part of your coalition, how they, how you keep them engaged as well as uh, the people. Um, I know you said a lot of those who were formerly detained want to stay engaged uh, because they have that 
personal experience, um, but for others or even their family members, um, how how do you keep them involved? Yeah, so we the way the the way I think about this is we want to make sure that folks are doing what they like to do and what they enjoy doing. And so getting involved has so many different components that, you know, we can break it down to um, policy, advocacy, uh, fundraising, um, accompaniment for folks that are being released from detention. There's so many ways that people can get involved. And so I always say whatever capacity you have is okay, you know, um, we understand people are, people have jobs, people are busy, coalitions have other work to do as well. But as long as they can provide those resources or support that they are able to and are happy to do so with no, um, you know, issues of, of it, um, any issues that, that might go like against their, um, their work plans or their, you know, jobs, then that's the best way that they can support. And so, yeah, I really just want to highlight that is that we want to make sure that folks are involved because they enjoy it or they want to be part of this. Mario, what is your greatest hope? Oh my God, I have so many. Um, my greatest hope is honestly to just end this incarceration system, which is just, it's so unnecessary and it's, it has broken up so many families. And, you know, in the long run, what happens is like these sentences become lifetime sentences, you know, if you get separated from your family because of deportation, there's a sense that you'll never see them again, you know, um, if they're still here and you're somewhere else. And so I really wanna, I would love to see this like end. Um, and then, yeah, just, it's 2021, we should all be at an equal level. Like, I don't understand why there's so many prejudices and so many discrimination and so much discrimination against folks. Um, you know, just in case we we missed anything, you know, what would you want the community to know about ICIJ? So I really like for the community to know that um, ICIJ continues and will always be here for for those folks that find themselves um, affected by, by immigration policies and systems. And that we are here to, you know, support them and be able to provide whatever they need at the time. Um, this last year, we were able to also, part of ICAJ provide a million dollars in uh, financial assistance to people that were excluded from any financial from any financial um, assistance from federal or state um, from state aid, and so not only are we serving you know legal um, services for folks that find themselves um, in detention or as part of deportation, but also. Um, just on a general basis, we want to make sure that our community thrives.